Welcome back, everybody, uh, to um, CS162. We're going to continue our discussion of ways of uh, getting reliability out of file systems. And then we're going to dive into some interesting material on distributed decision making. Um, if you remember last time, we were talking about uh, one of the ways that we get performance out of a file system, and that's with a buffer cache. And the buffer cache, of course, is the um, chunk of memory that's been set aside to hold various items, including disk blocks. And the example that I've shown here was basically that uh, when we talk about a file system and we have uh, directory data blocks and inodes and data blocks, et cetera, they're actually put into the buffer cache, which is typically handled LRU and uh, is the temporary waypoint for data moving in and off the disk. And this is, of course, the starting point for allowing us to read and write single bytes of data at a time. But it also is a, an important uh, performance uh, enhancer. And we, and we talked, among other things, about um, keeping dirty data in the buffer cache and not pushing it out to disk right away, and that that had some pretty important uh, performance benefits. It also has some potential issues with reliability if you should crash and the dirty data is still only on in memory and not on disk. So um, the other thing uh, that we started talking about then and that along those lines was what I like to call the illities. And so that's availability, durability, and reliability. Uh, and keep in mind that availability is kind of the minimum uh, bar to meet. And it's not a very good one oftentimes. So availability is typically the fact that you can actually talk to the system and it will re respond to you. It doesn't say that it'll respond correctly. And um, the other thing that's often the case is uh, we'll talk about number of nines of availability. So three nines typically means that there's a 99.9% .9 probability that the system will uh, respond to you. More important than availability, in my opinion at least, is durability and reliability. Durability says that the system can recover data despite the fact that things are failing. And uh, reliability is the ability of the system to essentially uh, perform things correctly. And that's really what you want, is you want reliability, not availability. OK? All right. Uh, and, and by the way, the example I like to give about the difference between durability and availability, for instance, is that uh, if you think about the Egyptian pyramids, there was a time when people didn't know what the various hieroglyphs meant. That, those, uh, what was written on the pyramids was extremely durable, but it wasn't available because people couldn't uh, decipher it. Okay, and it became available only after the Rosetta Stone was discovered. So the other thing uh, we talked about last time is we started talking about ways to protect bits. Not necessarily ways to protect the integrity of the operating system, the file system, so to speak, but integrity of the bits. And we talked about RAID, which you know from 61C. And in general, RAID uh, X, you know, whatever your level is, is a type of erasure code, which is uh, a code in which you know certain disks are gone and you fill in the missing disks using the code. Okay, that's called an erasure code. And the reason you're able to do that is essentially because the disks. Uh, have uh, error correction codes on them that let them recognize when the disks themselves are bad. And then you treat the whole disk as an erasure and you bring in the RAID codes. And what I did say was that today, disks are so big that RAID 5, which is what you learned about in 61C, for instance, is really not sufficient because uh, it can only recover from one failed disk. And uh, disks are so big now that while you uh, are busy recovering that disk by putting a new one in, uh, it might fail again, and at that point, you just lose all your data. So if you ever have a big file system uh, on a big file server, make sure you pick at least RAID 6, which is a, a possibility of two failed disks. And um, for instance, even odd is a, is a code that works for two disks uh, that's available on the readings. In general, you can do something that um, called a, a general Reed solomon code like um, this based on polynomials. And if you remember, um, as I, I mentioned this last time, but I thought I'd put this out there uh, when you were learning uh, about polynomials back in grade school, what you learned was that if you have a, an m minus one degree polynomial here, uh, as long as you have m points, then you can reconstruct the coefficients. Okay, And so the, the clever trick 
uh, with uh, Reed Solomon codes is you start with something that behaves like real numbers called a Galois field. Uh, we can talk about that offline if you like. And then you put your data at the coefficients and then you just generate a bunch of points. And here's an example where I generate N points where N is bigger than M. And as long as I get M of them back, then I can recover the polynomial and then I can get back my data. And so that's an erasure code because I can erase any number of these uh, points here as long as I still have M left. So I can erase up to N minus M of them and still get my data back. And that's a pretty powerful code. And you can choose how many uh, you need to recover from, how many failures, okay? And so uh, oftentimes in geographic replication, you can arrange to be able to lose uh, you know, um, 12 out of 16 chunks of data and that's extremely efficient. Good. So um, I'm glad that uh, CS70 also talked about this in general. Um, the uh, other thing we talked about last time, by the way, was there, were there any questions on, on uh, erasure codes at all? So um, well, you know that RAID 5 is as simple as uh, XORing. Um, even odd is, is a slightly different type of XORing. So that's, those are all very fast operations. The Reed solomon um, codes come in a bunch of different forms, some of which are fast and some of which aren't. <laughs> and so um, there's a bunch of different types of Reed solomons which are all isomorphic to this idea, but they're rearranged in a way where it's really fast to encode um, in some instances, and then it's, it's pretty fast. But um, typically the decoding phase is an N squared uh, complexity. So decoding can be, uh, when you fail, it can be expensive. Um, so the other thing I talked about uh, was, well, we, we were looking at file systems like the fast file system and NTFS, which are overwritten when you write new data. So when you put new data into a file, you overwrite the blocks that had uh, the old data in it. An alternative, uh, which you might imagine is a lot more um, reliable is copy on write file system. So here's an example of a file system where um, I'm just showing you a bi uh, binary tree. Think of these as the, uh, the pieces of the inodes and the old version of the file, sort of the blocks are down here in blue and they're in this tree. And the idea behind a copy on write system is that if I wanna say write some new data at the end or overwrite something, I don't actually overwrite the original data, but I build a whole new version of the file that uses as much as the old one as possible. So here was an example where I took this old block here, I added some new data to it, and I made a new block with a copy. And now by tying uh, my new inodes in with the old ones, I have, uh, by following the new version, you can see that we've got a new version of the file which this is updated, but the old version is still there. And so if I have a really bad crash in the middle of writing the new version, I can still recover the old version and I can pull various tricks to decide how much of the old version to keep around or how many old versions to keep around. And um, this is much more resilient to random failures, okay? And, and there's uh, several file systems that are like that. Now it would be um, potentially, the question here, is this more expensive in space or time? It certainly is uh, more expensive in space if you wanna think of it that way, but what you're getting back is um, extreme resilience to crashes and failures and the ability, if you decide that, this, uh, that you wrote something incorrectly, you can go back to a previous version. So this has some pretty nice benefits you get from the space overhead, because you notice that we're, um, we're not deleting old data right away. Um, and it's, it can be a little bit more expensive in time if uh, you have to worry about how these things are laid out. Maybe it doesn't have as fast of a read performance as something like the fast file system might be. So um, what about more general reliability solutions? Well, if we wanted to go back to the fast file system, let's say because we were worried about performance, and we wanted to make sure that the file system, the operating system, couldn't crash in a way that leaves things uh, vulnerable, then what might we do? And one of the things we talked about was very carefully picking the order. You write the blocks, and then you write the inodes, and then you put the inodes in a directory, and so on. And you do this in an order such that if it fails at any point, you can kind of throw out the things that weren't quite finally committed and um, go through a pass on the file system and find everything that's uh, disconnected, and you're good to go. 
The problem is that requires very careful thought. So a more general idea here is to use a transaction, which you've probably heard about if you've taken any of the database classes. But the idea here is that when you go to update a file, you're going to use transactions to provide uh, atomic updates to the file system such that there's a single commit point in which the new data is, uh, or the new version of the file system is ready to go. And until you reach that commit point, any of the things that you do to the file system can be undone. Now, if you think back to this copy on writes uh, example, as I'm writing everything here and producing my new version, the old version is fine. So if anything gets uh, screwed up, including just throwing out the new version, uh, the old version is still there. And if the only thing I need is to swap the old version for the new version which a, with a single operation, that's a single point of commit for the new file system. Okay, And so that's kind of like a transaction. Um, the transactional ideas are a little bit more general, okay? And so we're going to use transactions to give us clean commits to the uh, integrity of the file system. And then, of course, we're going to use redundancy to protect the bits. So the bits can be protected with uh, Reed solomon codes and eraser, other error correcting codes, raids, et cetera, okay? Now, just to remind you a little bit about what we mean about transactions, it's closely related to critical sections uh, that we talked about earlier in the term. They extend the concept of atomic updates from memory, which is where they came up originally in the early part of the term, to stable storage. And we're going to atomically update multiple persistent data structures with a single transaction. And as a result, we'll never get in a situation where the file system is partially updated and therefore corrupted. So there's lots of ad hoc approaches to this transactional-like thing. I just talked to you through the copy on write. In the fast file system, uh, they originally would order sequences of updates in a way so that if you crashed, you could do a, a process that scanned the whole file system called FSCK to recover from that those errors. Um, but again, that's very ad hoc. So this idea of a general transaction is like this. You start with consistent state number one in the file system, and you want to get to consistent state number two. Maybe consistent state number one uh, is the original file system, and number two is what you get when you add some new files and directories and data. And the transaction is a atomic way to get from the first state to the second one. And we know underlying the, uh, those that single atomic view change here, there's going to be a whole bunch of underlying um, a whole bunch of underlying changes to individual blocks. The question in the, uh, the chat here is what did I mean by ad hoc? What I mean by ad hoc is that a person sits down and they very carefully think through, well, if I update this and then I update that and then I update that and then I update that and the final thing I do is this, then I know that if it crashes anywhere along the way, I'll be able to recover the original file system. So ad hoc here means that you come up with a, a solution that is, uh, maybe it works, but you've had to go through a long process of thinking it through to make sure it works and it's possible that you got it wrong, okay? So that's what I mean by ad hoc here. We want something a little more systematic, okay? So, um, and we're gonna use transaction for this. Um, so atomic here, atomicness is really the process of making sure that uh, either everything happens or nothing happens, okay? And atomicness in the log will happen even if the machine gets unplugged, you wanna make sure that we still have that atomic property. Probably if you unplug it and you've got this atomic property, what's gonna happen is your changes aren't gonna happen, okay? So let's, let's walk through this a little bit more. So transactions are gonna extend this idea from memory to persistent storage. And here's a typical structure, of course, you start the transaction, you do a bunch of updates. Uh, if anything fails along the way, you roll back. Or if there are any conflicts, you roll back. Um, but then once you've committed the transaction, then that mere act of the, of the commit operation causes everything to be permanent now. OK, and so we'll talk about how to do this in a moment. but. Um, this do a bunch of updates thing could be arbitrarily complicated. It could be allocating new inodes. It could be grabbing some new blocks. It could be linking them. It could be doing all sorts of stuff. And the point is that none of that is going to be 
permanently affecting the contents of file system until we commit. And so that's what we're going to try to figure out how to do. Okay, that's the atomicness here is all of a sudden it, it happens or it doesn't happen at all. Now, um, of course, a classic example, you know, uh, transfer $100 from Alice's account to Bob's account. You see there's a bunch of these different pieces, right? Alice's account gets debited 100. Uh, the branch account, uh, that 100 goes to the other uh, bank. And then um, Bob's account somehow gets the balance and so on. And so uh, there are a series of operations in different parts of various people's databases. And if only some of them happen, then the banking system becomes inconsistent. Um, for instance, if it crashes, uh, the whole system crashes between de uh, debiting Alice's account and incrementing Bob's account, then not only did Alice lose money, well, she didn't get her $100, but Bob didn't get it either. And so that would be bad, okay? And so this idea of beginning transaction, ending committing transaction is one in which none of these things happen until the commit. Now, modern operating systems, uh, the question is, do they expose the transactions to the user? Um, depends a little bit on uh, which file system you've got. Certainly, there are some notions of transactions that are available. Others are, uh, others are less available. Right now, what we're going to talk about is mostly under the covers in a way that the user doesn't have access to. So the concept of a log to make all this work is the following. If you look at all of these pieces I've got here that represent parts of a, a global transaction, I'm going to write them in a chunk of memory slash disk that sort of, uh, think of this as a, this is the log and think of this as a big chunk of disk. And all of these things are going to be in there and they might be interleaved with other transactions. But what we're going to do is view this log serially starting from the left and going to the right and uh, we're going to start the transaction by putting a start transaction marker in the log. And then we can go ahead and do all of our stuff and everybody else can do their stuff. And it's only when we put a commit transaction at the end that now all of a sudden these actions atomically happen. OK, now a couple of things that should be clear from this. One is when I put start transaction, that needs to get committed to the log kind of before anything happens. And then when I put my various actions in here, before the final commit happens, it has to be the case that all of these other things are in the log. So it can't be the case that I do a commit, it gets on disk, but all of these other things are still in memory somewhere because then the machine could crash and I see, well, start transaction, commit transaction, but I have no idea what I just committed and that would be bad. Okay, so, um, the log is, is clearly going to be something that we're going to need to be pushing out to disk, and it's going to be have an ordering requirement that's very important in order to make this all work. And the other thing that I'll point out here is notice that if I write these uh, operations in the log, dump, dump, A, B, C, D, dump, and then I say commit, this doesn't necessarily mean that I've actually put them into the file system or actually pr produced the actions yet. What it means is that if, if I were to crash and I hadn't done them yet, I'd be able to uh, wake up after the crash and go through the log and figure out what the, the state of the system is supposed to be. So the state of the system is not only what's on disk in the file system, but also what's in the log and, um, and ordered in a way that I can go back and reconstruct after a crash. And I'm going to show you um, a couple of animations here just to give you a better idea how that works. All right. Okay. So the commit is like sealing an envelope and saying the transaction now happened. Now, um, so now the question is, uh, in, shouldn't things be logged after they happen? Well, uh, in this type of log, we're, we're doing um, something in which it's called write ahead logging. We're actually writing into the log before it's put into the file system. Okay, and the reason for that is so it's, it's the opposite of the way you're thinking of this, I think. Um, we want to write in the log first rather than modifying the file system so that if the commit never comes because we crash, then the file system's OK. If we were to start modifying the file system and then put the commits in the log, now we're in a bad situation where we might have already corrupted the file system by doing a partial update. Okay. So this is, uh, I'm glad you asked that question. This is the opposite maybe of the way you were thinking. So thanks for that uh, clarification question. 
Um, so here's a transactional file system uh, example. So we're going to get better reliability through the log, a log. Changes are treated as transactions, and a transaction is committed once it's written to the log. Data is going to be forced uh, to disk to get for reliability. Uh, there's a possibility of using non-volatile RAM or flash or whatever to make this faster because we can put things into non-volatile RAM maybe, maybe more quickly than we can write it to the disk. So perhaps the NVRAM can serve as the head of our log. Um, and although the file system may not be updated right away, the data is going to be in the log. Now, the question here is, does the log negate the performance benefits of a buffer cache? Uh, and the answer is, it depends. <laughs> Um, it depends on what you're logging. Not everybody, uh, not all versions of journaling file systems, we'll talk about that in a moment, write all the data to the log first and then back to the file system. Okay. Um, so let's just, uh, let's go forward a few more here before um, I answer that last question in the, in the chat here, and then maybe I'll answer it for you. Hold on one second, okay? So the difference, by the way, between a log structured and a journaled file system is in a log structured file system, uh, all the data is only in the log. It doesn't even go to the file system. Whereas in journaled file system, the log is really just helping us get reliability. Okay. And um, when do we start logging? Well, as soon as we've started up the file system, we start the logging. Okay. All right. Now, um, maybe I will uh, just give you a little bit of a preview here. The question that's in the chat, which I hadn't answered yet, is if not all actions have been completed and you crash, how do you figure out which have and haven't uh, been completed? And let me, let's just hold that question and see if this gets answered, OK? So we're going to focus in the next several slides on something called a journaling file system, where we don't modify the data structures on the disk directly uh, right away. We write updates. In as a transaction into the log, kind of typically called a journal or an intention list. And um, then when we commit, then we're going to have the potential to put them into the file system. Okay. Once changes are in the log, they can be safely applied uh, to the file system, modifying inode pointers, directory mappings, et cetera. And the question that's uh, in the chat here about, well, do we have to have all of our operations be idempotent to make this work? The answer is no. And we'll see how this works in just a second. So, well, some of them need to be identified, but um, let's see if this uh, answers your question. So garbage collection is uh, going to be a possibility here. So once we've actually applied things out of the log successfully into the file system, then we can remove things from the log. Okay. Now, Linux essentially took the uh, original fast file system and called it ext2, uh, and then they added a journal to it to get ext3. So ext3 is really just like a fast file system, Linux style, uh, with a journal, OK? And there are a bunch of options that Linux gives you about whether, for instance, to write all the data to the, to the uh, log first and then to the file system. Uh, and that double writing, surprisingly enough, uh, doesn't always hurt you from a performance standpoint, because the log, remember, is, is sequential, and so it's very fast. So a lot of other examples of journaling file systems, NTFS, Apple HFS Plus, Linux XFS, JFS, CXT4, there's a bunch of options here. OK, so let's create a file. But this is no journaling yet. So think of this as like fast file system or EXT3. So we can see where we're going with this. So when you create a brand new file and write some data, there's a bunch of independent things that have to happen. So first thing is you got to find some free data blocks. So here's an example. Let's call it this yellow thing's a single free data block. Have to find ourselves a free inode entry. So on in the inode table, find a an insertion point in the directory. So maybe there's some uh, blocks in the directory we're going to change. Excuse me. All right, and then we're going to link things together. So we're going to write uh, the map, which basically says uh, mark which blocks are in use. OK, we're going to um, write the inode entry to the blocks. We're going to write the directory entry to point to the inode. All right, and when we're done, uh, now we've got a, a new um, pointer in a directory. This is a mapping between a name and an i number. That points to an inode, which we've allocated, which points to a disk block. And now, so notice all these different individual pieces uh, and, and the free space update. Uh, have all happened just to create a file and write to it. And if we sort of partially do this and we crash, then we're going to end up with dangling blocks 
Uh, like, for instance, if we didn't successfully write the directory entry, then we could have an inode entry pointing to a data block, and it's not in any directory, and it's effectively lost. Okay. So let's see how we could add a, a log to this, or a journal. So if you notice here, um, we're going to put this log in some non-volatile storage, flash or on disk, for instance, is the simplest thing. It's going to have a head and a tail. So the head is the point at which we write. The tail is the point at which we read. Okay. And let's go through and see what happens when we write our new file. So we're going to first find a free data block. And notice that I found the block. But what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to find my free inode entry, going to find my directory insertion point. But I'm not going to actually do anything. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a start transaction in the log. I'm going to uh, write the free space map. I'm going to uh, write the inode entry. Uh, pointing at the, uh, you know, which where it's supposed to go. So I'm going to, excuse me, write an inode entry here without actually writing the disk. And then I'm going to write a directory entry without actually writing it on disk. Okay. And notice that all of these things are reversible because if I crash at any point up till now, I haven't actually modified anything in the file system. So the file system is going to look exactly like it did before I started this process. Okay. Now, when I hit commit, poof, all of a sudden, it's committed. Now, think this through for a second. Notice there's no changes to the disk. Okay, And yet, the mere act of writing commit to the log now makes that file committed. And the reason is that the state of the file system is considered what's on disk plus what's in the log. OK, and so if I crash at any point after the commit gets written in there, what I'm going to do is I'm going to scan the log. And at that point, I can apply the updates to the file system, and things are going to look OK. And I can keep crashing. So these are idempotent. This was a question earlier, because uh, the, um, the log has basically been choosing blocks for us. But we can keep overwriting the same block over and over again with the same data, and it's not going to matter. And so I can keep trying until I eventually get past the commit, at which point the file system will actually be updated to reflect this change. So the mere act of writing the commit in the log means that that file has been written with, it, with its new data. Okay. So after commit, we can replay the transaction, like I said, supposing we don't crash. We can replay the transaction by just writing stuff onto disk, eventually copying everything there. And once it's copied, then I can start moving the tail, see how I'm applying stuff. And if I get past the commit at that point, then I can throw out everything that's in the log. OK, now here's a good question in the, in the um, chat here. So what about reads? Do they have to scan the log for changes that haven't been flushed yet? No, this is where the block cache comes into play, right? So the block cache has the most up-to-date state of the blocks uh, as as reflected by the total state of the file system, including what's on the log and what's on disk. And so the block cache, uh, since the block cache filters the reads and writes from the user, uh, it basically makes everything fast, regardless of whether it's actually only in the log or if it's on disk. OK. So the block cache is an important aspect of making things fast here. Now, uh, the question here, you can't flush until you commit. Uh, that's correct. So this is, again, right ahead uh, logging here. Well, right ahead logging says that you have to get the log values on the in the log before you hit commit. Once they're in the log, then you can flush things out to disk. So yes, you have to get them to the log first, and then they can be flushed onto, uh, onto the file system on the disk. Well, if the cache is full, and it's a really large write, then uh, then you have to make sure that uh, you've committed first. OK. Um, so there's a lot of uh, potentially complicated questions about scheduling here and when you're allowed to schedule things, et cetera. Um, I don't want to go into it too much right now. But what I will say is you can imagine that uh, the file system knows when it's in tr when it might be in trouble by allowing too many writes uh, before the log has been cleared, and all it has to do is put the clients to sleep uh, until things have been properly flushed, and then it can wake the clients up. Okay, and so this is you just have to keep track of what the current state is so that you always have this write ahead logging property. Okay. 
Now, um, once we've committed everything, then we can just throw out the log and the tail has moved here. All right. Um, what's the size of the log? That's changeable. So um, depends on how much data you want to have. Now notice, by the way, that what we've got in this particular log actually didn't log the data necessarily. So we could write our data to uh, the disk and it's only the metadata that's logged. That's one of the modes. Um, that's one of the modes that basically uh, uh, the Linux file system has in. Another mode is one in which the data first goes into the log and then goes back out on disk. Okay. Now, uh, if the system crashes after commit, but before we've fully applied everything, that's okay because we can just keep restarting because we don't remove things from the log until we've actually gotten past commit uh, uh, with the thing not crashing and everything pushed out to disk. That's the point at which we do a single uh, atomic move of the tail, which uh, throws out this particular entry. So we don't really need to know exactly which changes are have been applied. We just take wherever the tail was, you know, so the tail might be here and uh, we're trying to apply and we keep crashing over and over again. Well, we just, we can restart um, and it's back after we get past the commit that we can then uh, throw that log entry out. Okay, this particular version of this, the changes are idempotent. There are other ways you can do things, but we're gonna leave it this way for now. Okay, now um, let's look at this uh, and situation here where we started that process and we crashed. Um, and notice this is what it looks like after crash. So maybe we found our blocks and we started to write our updates. We didn't get a commit record in here. Then all we do is we just uh, detect at this point that we've crashed. And all we have to do is we just throw everything out that hasn't been uh, committed yet and we're, we're good to go. All right, and all of this stuff can be thrown out. I didn't quite have a, a good um, example here, but you can basically throw out things that you haven't touched. And um, transactions without commit records then are ignored from that point on, all right? Um, the other thing is if uh, we recover and we have complete transactions, we scan the log, we find complete start commit uh, um, examples. And at that point, we can just redo as usual. And um, in the process, we update our uh, block cache. And then once we got past that part of the boot, then everything works as normal. All right. So I've just given you the start, but I, I hope it gave you the idea what's going on. So why do we go to all this trouble the answer is that updates become atomic even if we crash. Okay, so we either get all is either applied entirely or not at all. And so all of these physical operations, and there are potentially many of them, are a single logical unit. Okay, we get an atomic update. Um, now you might ask, isn't this expensive? Well, it is expensive if we are in the mode where we're writing all the data twice, except the log is typically um, sequential on the disk. And so the cost of writing to disk in the log is actually much faster than trying to write all of the different pieces throughout the file system. So that's actually faster than you might think. And there are some circumstances where this write to the log with your data and then put it into the file system can actually give you some boosted performance under some circumstances, okay? Especially when you've got a bunch of random writes, then you can get them out on the disk quickly. Um, so. Modern file systems give you an option to, to do metadata updates only in the log. And this is where you're gonna record the file system data structures like directory entries, inode use and, and et cetera. And what happens in the worst case where you crash and but you haven't flushed your data is now you get a file with garbage in it but you don't lose a bunch of files, okay? And so that's a trade-off between uh, reliability and performance. It gives you sort of an option uh, to do slightly less than uh, full atomicity when it comes to the data itself, okay? Now, um, a full buffer cache is, uh, could be an example, yes, where your write call comes back and not everything's been written, that's correct. Okay. All right, now let's talk briefly about something that I wanted to remind everybody of. Are there any more questions? Okay, and so by the way, ext3 is the uh, 
is the version of the Linux ext2 file system, fast file system, that's got a journal in it. And all they did was they took that file system and they had a special file that serves as the journal. So, all right. So I wanted to remind everybody, because we've had some people that I think have forgotten a little bit about the collaboration pro, uh, policy for CS162. So you got to be careful, OK? We, we do not want uh, people importing parts of code from other people, OK? So things that are OK here are, for instance, explaining a concept to somebody in another group could be OK, but don't explain exactly how to do something. If it's a concept that, for instance, I talk about in class, that's a perfectly OK thing to talk about, OK? Um, discussing algorithms or strategies at a high level is probably OK. OK, discussing de debugging approaches like um, sort of using, you know, how do you produce uh, printfs that you can go through easily to find out what's going on or, you know, what is your overall structure for testing? Those kind of things are OK. Uh, searching online for generic algorithms like hash tables, that's OK. All right. Things that are not OK are things that are likely to get caught by our uh, catch by uh, the code that we run to, to uh, catch collaboration cases, all right? So sharing code or test cases explicitly with another group or write out, uh, copying or reading another group's code. So you shouldn't be even looking at other people's code, OK, or their test cases. Uh, copying or reading online code or test cases from prior years, that's not OK. OK, so if, they, if you're straying into specifics about a particular uh, project or homework, you're, you're probably in the red zone, OK? Helping somebody in another group to debug their code, that's also not OK. Um, we did have a good example in a past term uh, where somebody sat down with a group that was having trouble, and they were helping them debug. And, um, but they, this person sat with them for so long that as they kept kind of incrementally changing their code, the code ended up with a structure that looked so much like uh, this uh, the helpers group's code that the two groups uh, were flagged for uh, over collaboration, and that that's a problem. Okay, so um, be very careful not to do that. Okay, because we want you to be all doing your own personal work on homeworks and uh, exams, of course, and your own groups work in group work, OK? So we compare all the project submissions against prior year submissions, online solutions, et cetera. And we will take actions uh, against offenders that um, have sort of uh, violated this code, OK? And you can take a look on, um, on the homepage. We have a discussion of this in more detail. Um, so and don't put a friend in a bad position by asking for help that they shouldn't give you, OK? We've had in past terms, we've had people that have pleaded with friends of theirs uh, until the person just gave them some code to get them to leave them alone. And um, that ended up uh, ending not well for both of the people. So just uh, try to do your own work, OK? And I remind you this because we, we have caught uh, what appear to be a number of collaboration cases. And uh, we've only gone through some, some of the things. So, Try to try to not put yourself in a bad position. Okay. All right. Now that we have stunned everybody into silence, let's uh, let's talk about some real topics again here. So I'm going to assume that everybody will be very careful. Okay. So let me um, take this idea of logging that we just had and journaling and take it to its extreme, OK? So one extreme is called the log structured file system, which is an actual research file system on the Sprite operating system that was, uh, I have a paper up in the resources page. You can take a look at it. And in this case, it's like what I just told you with the journal, but there is no file system underneath. So the log is the storage, OK? So the log is one continuous sequence of blocks that wraps around the whole disk. Inodes get put into the log when they're changed. Uh, Data is put into the log, et cetera. And everything's just in the log, OK? So here's an example where we create two new files, dear one, file one, dear two, file two, um, and write new data for the files. 
And here's the log. And notice this is a sprite log structure file system. And notice what happens is that there were some blocks and stuff in the files. Uh, it, there were some uh, parts of the file system in the log prior to this picture. But we're writing file one. And what we do is we write some data, which goes into the log. And then we, uh, we change the inode for the directory. That also goes into the log. OK, and then we write some data for the second file and for the directory. And all that stuff goes into the log. And ultimately, uh, if the since the inodes for dir1 and dir2 have changed, then we're going to put uh, the updated inodes for, say, the root file system also in the log. And when all is said and done, all of our data is in the log. It's just in the, in the order in which it was written. <laughs> all right? And um, we never take it out of the log just stays in the log. And then if we overwrite, say, uh, part of file one, what will happen is we'll put the new overwritten data, and then we'll put a new inode, which links to it, and so on. And at some point, the data is uh, going to be kind of obsolete in parts of the log. There'll be a bunch of holes. And at that point, we're going to do some garbage collection. But up until that point, the log is the file system. OK, and it's kind of like Git. Yep, there's a little bit of, of that aspect. So here's an example of the Unix file system, fast file system, where when we write data, we're actually um, writing the data on the block groups where it was intended to be close to the inodes um, for that directory. So here's an inode for the directory. We write some directory data. Here's an inode for the file. We write some file data. It's in a specific spot on the disk. It's been laid out in a way to try to make it fast. And if you notice, the data here is laid out to be fast for reading, but the writes go all over, whereas the data in the log searcher file system is made to be very fast for writes, but reads will suffer. And the whole, if you read that paper, which is, which is a classic, what you'll see is a justification for this is write bandwidth is often at premium, so you're going to make it the writes go really fast, and um, you're going to rely on the block cache to be big enough to give you really fast read performance. OK, and um, so the other interesting aspect of this is, as, as we've been talking about transactions, is that um, this fact that things are structured as a log means that we can really easily undo things if we've got a failure. OK, and so part of what's in here are commit records. And so if we crash in the middle of writing, then we just go back to an earlier part of the log and our file system is good to go without any changes. So the log structured file system kind of has built into it this idea of journaling because the log is the file system. Okay. Now, um, so the log is what's recorded on disk. Uh, file system operations to figure out what's going on kind of logically replay the log to figure that out and put things in the block cache to make it fast. Okay, everything gets written in the log. Um, large and portion, uh, large important portions of the log is cached in memory, which is how we get things to be fast. And you do everything in bulk. So the log is a collection of large segments on the disk that are uh, completely uh, sequential relative to each other to make things fast. And if you read the paper, you'll see that rather than what I first told you, where there's a single log that goes through the whole disk. In fact, there's a whole series of these big segments, and they garbage collect in segments. All right. Um, and you know, the way you get free space back is you got to garbage collect um, all of the holes that are in the log after you've overwritten data. And so there's a garbage collection process, too, that we won't go into for now. All right. Now, the reason I brought this up is one thing I promised you a couple of weeks ago but never did was, what about flash file systems? OK, well, how are they different from the fast file system? And I wanted to remind you what flash is like. So this is a, um, a CMOS transistor, which you've uh, probably seen in some of your early classes. And the idea here is that um, when this floating gate is uh, high, then uh, we end up with essentially turning a switch on so that the data can flow through this switch. And when this uh, floating gate is low, then uh, the switch is turned off. So th without this extra gate, we, um, or, or say no floating gate, just a control gate, we end up with a transistor. The way that flash works is, uh, don't want to say that yet, the way that flash works is we actually trap electrons in this floating gate, uh, which has oxide on either side of it. And the result of trapping the, the electrons in there give us enough of a difference that we can detect 
And that's a way that we can store a one or a zero in here uh, in distinguishing from the um, non-charge uh, trapped state, okay? The thing that's funny about this is we can't write it, once we've written it, we cannot overwrite it until we erase it. So if you remember, um, I talked about this a, a couple of weeks ago, you can never overwrite pages. What you need to do is you need to erase big blocks of bits and then you keep them on a free list and you get these uh, 4K byte pages that you use off the free list to build your file system with. And then eventually um, you garbage collect a big block and erase it again, okay? And so this is a little different from say a disk, okay? Um, and another thing that's important here is that these, the way I write, as I, as I alluded to, is I trap electrons on this floating gate. Now, the way that that happens is I raise this word line so high that the electrons go zooming across the insulators and get on the floating gate. And if I go even higher, I can encourage them to go away and clear the gate off. Well, that's a pretty uh, harsh process. And eventually, electrons get trapped uh, in the, ins in the uh, insulator and then this doesn't work as well. And so the flash actually wears out. And so anybody making uh, a file system out of this has to be careful not to erase and overwrite too many times, okay? And uh, yes, we trap electrons to, uh, to uh, store Reddit posts, posts and cat videos. And um, as I mentioned, uh, because we're trapping uh, things in here, this is a higher energy state. It's technically, it's heavier. And so you can go look at where I talked about a few lectures ago, uh, the fact that a Kindle is technically heavier once you've put uh, books on it, okay? Now, the, the part that, one of the parts that makes this easier is what's called the flash translation layer, which uh, basically says that unlike a disk where we number all the sectors and then the file system says, I want you know, sector 5,496, what happens in a flash or SSD is there's actually a translation layer. So when you ask for a particular number, that goes through a translation layer and tells you which block on the flash is actually the current version of 5,226. And as you go through overriding that from the uh, operating system level, the underlying flash translation level will keep changing which physical block there is, okay? And so that underlying flash translation layer automatically takes care of wear leveling and making sure we're not wearing out our bits. But the question might be, is there something we could do with the file system to make that work better? Okay. And um, there's firmware that run on SSDs and so on. And so the question is, can we take uh, advantage of this information to do something with it? And the answer is yes. So the flash file system, um, the F2FS file system, which is actually used on mobile devices like Pixel 3 from Google. It was originally from Samsung. Um, is actually a, a file system that's been adapted to use the properties of Flash. Um, it assumes that this SSD interface, which looks like a disk for all practical purposes, has underneath it a, a Flash translation layer, the fact that random reads are very fast, they're as fast as sequential reads, and that random writes are essentially bad for Flash storage. And the reason is that if I write randomly, then I make it a little harder for, uh, for the underlying flash translation layer to erase big blocks because to erase a big block where you have a bunch of random blocks written, you actually have to copy the data out of the blocks um, onto some pristine ones and then you can erase. And so that actually ends up wearing the flash out a little bit more if I do random writes, okay? And so we're gonna minimize writes or updates and try to keep writes sequential. And so what they do is they actually start with a log structured file system uh, with co and a copy on write file system made out of it, um, keeping writes as sequential as possible. And there's a, a node translation table to help us keep things sequential. And you can, for more details, you can actually uh, check out paper in the reading session section as well, um, called the F2FS, a new file system for flash storage. Okay. Um, but just to show you a little bit, uh, the log. Uh, in the flash file system, which I'm showing you here, is actually split into a whole bunch of segments. And those segments are ones that get written a lot versus ones that aren't written as frequently. And so they actually lay out a bunch of different logs to try to manage how, how um, busy the file system area is. Um, there's a translation table um, inside the operating system in addition to the one that's on the SSD. 
and they try to classify blocks as being written frequently and not, okay? And there's a checkpoint operation and so on. I'm not gonna go into great detail on this, but I did wanna mention some of these things so if you're curious, you can take a look. Um, for instance, here is uh, an index structure of inodes. And if you look at the log structured file system, what you see is that if I update a file, file data, I write that in the log, then I've got to write the uh, direct pointer block over again into the log, then I got to write the indirect pointer, and then I got to write the inode, and then I got to write the inode maps, and so on. I got to write a whole bunch of blocks just because I changed some data in the log structured file system, and that's because uh, I never update in place in the log structured file system. I work my way through uh, by writing all of the change things into the log, well, this means that there's a lot more changes. And so one of the things that they do in this F2FS is they actually use a, a second translation table to, to uh, translate so that the inode, for instance, at a higher level has a name for this block and that block is in a translation table. Okay, and so they make some interesting modifications to the log structured file system. All right, and I'm not going to go into this in any more detail, but I just wanted to give you some ideas of what you might go through to try to make things faster. Okay, and to take advantage of the fact that you can do random reads, but random writes are uh, expensive and wear the file system out. Okay, all right. Now, time to switch gears. Um, unless there were any uh, additional questions on log structured file systems or transactions or what have you. Maybe I'll pause for a second while everybody's digesting the thoughts here. So in both the log structured file system and in the F2FS, files are just in the log, all right? There is no file system uh, there's no other file system underneath it. So log structured file systems are good for writes. Can anybody answer why the log structured file system might be good for writes? It's a good question. Right, the log is sequential. So therefore, uh, it, on a disk, it goes on the track rather than randomly writing all over. And so it doesn't matter what your writes are, they all go right at one after another on a sequential set of tracks on the disk. And so they're very fast because you're avoiding seek time. In the uh, F2FS, the advantage is, is a little bit different, but you're sequentially writing a whole bunch of blocks so that um, when you go back to overwrite them again, the, uh, the log can be erased as a group of blocks can be erased and it, so it's, it uh, matches up with the underlying um, architecture of the system. So the, the log structured file system does lead potentially to fragmentation in the sense that you got a lot of holes in old parts of the log and that's where garbage collection comes into play. And so if you take a look at the papers, you'll see that what really happens is the log, as, as time goes on, the old parts of the log have more and more holes in them because you've overwritten data that is in those places. And at some point, you just take the data that's remaining, you copy it to a new part of the log, and then you uh, re reclaim everything that was in that old part of the log. So it's a type of garbage collection. All right. Good. Now, so switching gears. Um, if you remember, I think the first day I kind of said what's, what's cool about operating systems is they are part of this huge world-class uh, system. Everything from little tiny devices tied into local networks to cars to uh, phones to even refrigerators and computers and up in through big machine rooms and the cloud and so on, all are part of one huge system. And um, the, when, I, when, I think about, um, when I think about what I'm interacting with <clears throat> on a day-to-day -day basis, I like to think about how the, the things I do down at the small scale are actually utilizing resources spread throughout the globe, okay? And it's amazing when you think about it. Um, sometimes when I think about the whole thing, it's, it's astounding to me that it all works somehow, and sometimes it doesn't entirely work, but it mostly works. But the interesting question that comes to mind is sort of how do you get all of these things that are spread uh, geographically 
and in domains of fast local connection, but really slow uh, long distance connection, et cetera. How do you get them to all work together? And so uh, for the last few lectures, um, we're getting down to the last like five or six lectures here. I'm gonna talk a bit about um, distributed systems and how they can all work together to do, for instance, distributed decision-making, which is a topic we're gonna start today. Um, and so to start that topic, let's bring back some what it turns out to be very old terminology, but I thought I'd make sure we were all on the same page here. So a centralized system is one in which there's a central component, a server of some sort that is uh, performing all the major functions. And you have a bunch of clients that are all talking to the server. And that's typically called a client server model. Okay. And um, many of the things that you deal with, with your cell phone, for instance, where the cell phone is one of the clients, and something in the cloud as a server, that's actually, uh, that's actually like a modern analog of this traditional client server uh, situation here. The question that immediately comes to mind with a centralized server is, well, how do you scale this? I mean, what happens if you've got not three clients, but 100,000 or a million clients, clearly one server can't do it, okay? And so, you know, we know that in the cloud, there are many servers, but the question might be, how do you structure them to do something intelligent when you've got many components, okay? Now, a completely different model is what I like to call the peer-to-peer -peer model, in which um, every component in the peer-to-peer -peer model is a peer of the other components. So if you notice in this client-server model, we really had uh, the server was kind of king and uh, the clients were subjects or something like that. Whereas in the case of the peer-to-peer -peer model, we, uh, we have a whole bunch of peers that are all interacting with each other. And, uh, you know, you might ask the, you know, in this client server case, it's pretty obvious who's responsible for what. You get in the peer-to-peer -peer model, it becomes unclear, okay? But the peer-to-peer -peer model is uh, kind of a good starting point for if we want to try to make this server idea uh, spread and handle a really high load. So for instance, maybe we could draw a box around a bunch of these guys working in peer-to-peer -peer mode and treat that as a server, okay? Um, so what's the motivation for distributing in that way rather than having a single client? And you know, you could come up with lots of reasons, right? Why do people do anything? Well, here, maybe it's cheaper and easier to build lots of little simple computers rather than a huge server in the middle. Or maybe it's e easier to add power incrementally. So what I mean by that is, if I've got a good peer-to-peer -peer model and I, and I need more power, I just add some more computers to it, right? And if things work, then by adding a few more servers or whatever, now I've got a more powerful system than I started with, okay? And I can do that incrementally. Um, maybe users have complete control over some of their components. So maybe that big peer-to-peer -peer system, I've got some that I own, and yeah, I'm gonna help everybody else a bit, but I have full control over my hardware and I can bring it back when I want. And of course, collaboration um, is an obvious goal here because maybe by putting together a peer-to-peer -peer model, it's easier to collaborate. Um, so the promise of these distributed systems is really that it's, they're much more available because there's more components that are likely to be up. Uh, it's better durability. So maybe by copying my data to lots of different machines, it's more likely it'll survive a crash. And maybe there's more security because each piece is smaller and maybe easier to make secure. Okay, now you should be questioning some of these statements here for a moment. Um, the reality uh, is typically different, okay? So this is Leslie Lamport. Uh, he's, he's done all sorts of really uh, cool system stuff. And we'll talk a little bit about um, a couple of them uh, in the next lecture and a half. But uh, what he liked to talk about is the fact that the reality behind a lot of distributed systems is actually disappointing. So the availability is worse rather than better because it depends on every machine being up. He's got a very famous quote, uh, which is a distributed system is one in which the failure of a computer you didn't know existed can re render your own computer unusable, <laughs> all right? It could have worse reliability because you lose data if any machine crashes. Uh, it could have worse security, of course, because anyone in the world can break into one component, and if they're all tied together, they've broken into everything. So distributed systems have high promise, but you got to be really careful how you use them, right? Coordination 
becomes very difficult. So you got to coordinate multiple copies of shared state information. And what would be easy in a centralized system, because everybody's going through one central computer, becomes a lot more difficult when you've got things distributed. And of course, trust, security, privacy, denial of service, these are all words that you've heard a lot of. But um, many new variants of these problems arise as soon as we start distributing. So uh, can you trust other machines of a distributed application enough to uh, perform a protocol correctly? I think there's a corollary of Lamport's quote that I like to, to think of, which is a distributed system is one where you can't do work because some computer you didn't even know existed is successfully coordinating an attack on your system. All right, that's the standard DDoS. So uh, what are some goals of this kind of system? So you'd like transparency, which is the ability of the system to mask its complexity. Remember earlier I said, well, the way we go from a server system to something that can handle lots of clients, 100,000 or a million, is we put a bunch of things together, but we draw a box around them and we make it transparently behave the same way as a single computer would, okay? So we don't have to know about the complexity. So what are some transparencies we might come up with? Well, one is location transparency, where you don't have to know where resources are located. Pretty much anybody who's dealt with the cloud has uh, understood what location transparency is like. Perhaps migration, so that resources can move around, maybe for better performance or better durability or what have you, without us having to know uh, that they've been moving. Maybe replication. Well, perhaps I pay to make sure my data doesn't go away. And so underneath the covers, the system transparently increases the number of copies, or maybe it does erasure coding uh, transparently in a way that I don't need to know about, but makes my data much uh, more durable. Um, maybe I don't have to know how many users are out there. So uh, one of the things that has worked pretty well about the cloud is everybody's kind of interacting point to point between their phone and something out there. Uh, without having to know how many other people are acting with something out there, okay? And so that level of concurrency uh, works pretty well if you're just working one-to-one uh, -one on something. Now, if you're actually collaborating on something, then that gets a little more tricky. And so concurrency uh, is, is problematic under some circumstances. Parallelism. So the system may speed up uh, large jobs by splitting them into small pieces transparently without telling you. Fault tolerance, okay, that's kind of like what I said about replication. Maybe the system's gonna hide the fact that things are going wrong um, and do so in a way that you still make forward progress. Okay, so transparency and collaboration require some way for different processors to communicate with one another. And of course, that's gonna lead to the need for networks and so on. And we're gonna talk about networks um, in more detail in a lecture or two. But for now, um, I wanna talk about uh, this idea of decision-making being spread across a bunch of nodes, because that's kind of the beginnings of how we do this particular thing. So um, the question about, is it a goal for us to not be able to tell where resources are located? Uh, I, I would say yes and no. I think it's better to think of it as, I don't want to know, have to know where the, lo where the um, resources are unless I care. Right? I'd like the system to transparently adapt them as long as it's within the uh, boundaries of my policies and my goals for privacy and what have you. I'd like the system to deal with that without me having to deal with it. And if I care, then another goal would be able to selectively break the transparency to meet some goal for why I wanted to care, but then the rest of the transparencies are still there. Um, so it's really the desire to not have to know. Um, and a, a really important transparency, by the way, is what happens when a machine crashes that's storing some of your data. You don't want to have to somehow go log into your um, application and change an IP address uh, to point to a different server just because some server crashed. You'd like that process to be transparent. Okay. So... Think of these uh, goals as things that I would like to be transparent unless I care. Okay. Um, perhaps you think of it as opacity, but I think it's really transparency. It's uh, masking complexity behind. Okay. So I don't have to know. Um, so how do entities communicate? Well, some sort of protocol. So clearly there's going to be um, communication through a, uh, a network of some sort of messages, 
And a protocol is really an agreement on how to communicate, including things like syntax, how does a communication uh, structured and uh, specified, and semantics about what a communication means. So actions taken where uh, transmitting, receiving, when a timer expires, et cetera. Okay. Um, the, uh, so I'm noticing on the chat here, uh, so masking equals transparency. So that is a funny, uh, a funny use of terminology perhaps, but um, you'd like things to um, be uh, invisible to you happening under the covers. That's where the word transparent. So it's sort of the, you see the functionality uh, without having to know what's happening underneath. And so that's, that's often called a transparency. I realize it seems, it seems a little, little strange, but that is a use of that terminology. Um, so for instance, um, protocols are often described uh, by a state machine on either side. So here's an example where I've got two state machines and part of what the protocol is doing is it's tracking the states on both sides so that both sides have the same notion of the state of the world. And um, the protocol is responsible for making sure that that state is maintained. So that if both sides, suppose this is separate sides of the world and the state machines are being transparently replicated, that's again, the use of the word transparent, then, um, then I can act on the current state of the system here, uh, say at Berkeley in, uh, in Beijing, and, I'm, and I have confidence that I'm working on the same information as the other side. Um, and so usually there's some stable storage that's part of this state replication. Um, you could even think of uh, a, a simple example might be that these are two versions of the same file system. There's a transparent protocol and the states represent the state of the file system and it's keeping things in sync. Okay, so that's another example of, uh, of a good protocol. Okay, and so, um, you know, we want, among other things, stability in the face of failure. So even when parts of the system are failing or the storage falls apart in one place, but it's, there's still storage in other places, we'd like the state machine replication to uh, continue to work properly. And it may be that endpoints uh, are selectively failing, but if I were to vote, let's say, among the states of all the different uh, participants, so suppose I've got three participants and one of them fails, a voting process could uh, maybe be employed to figure out what the real state of the system actually is. And we'll talk about some of this in a moment. So examples of protocols in human interaction, I mean, I thought I'd put this down just for the heck of it. You know, you got, you got a phone, you pick up the phone, call somebody, you listen for the dial tone. Okay, so maybe you don't do that on a cell phone, but see you have service. You, uh, you dial the number, you hear ringing, and the callie says, hello? And you say, hi, it's John, or uh, hi, it's me. Um, that's my favorite kind of goofy introduction. It's like, well, what's that about? Who's, who's me? Um, but then uh, you kind of say, uh, hey, do you think uh, blah, 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 blah? And they say, yeah, blah, 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 blah. And you say goodbye, and they say goodbye, and you hang up. Now. Uh, this is probably a conversation that you had um, late at night sometimes, including the blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I know I've had a few of them myself. But really, you're thinking about a protocol, because there's a protocol which goes from ringing to answering at the other side uh, to a responding, so the answer comes back, and now you know that that connection's been uh, set up. Uh, or the caller says something, the callee responds with a response, and then there's some process for hanging up. And so this protocol of synchronizing the states between the person that made the call and the other person is, is a human interactive version of uh, what we would like to do in our protocols, okay? And um, the problem is, you know, there's many pieces of hardware. This has been our standard issue throughout this whole term where we talked about the fact that hardware is vastly different uh, at, you know, at the IO level. And so how do we deal with that? And so if you look here, uh, when we're talking about communicating, we have a bunch of applications at one level. We have a bunch of ways that things are communicating, you know, maybe a coaxial cable or fiber optics or whatever. And the question is, um, the, the many different applications have to communicate over a bunch of different media. And um, there are many different styles. And what do you do? Well, 
you don't want to make a point-to-point -point, uh, application where Skype talks uh, one way through coaxial and another through fiber optic and another through wireless and so on, because you're going to very rapidly get N squared uh, blow up in complexity, right? So for instance, we added some new application like HTTP. It shouldn't be the case that we have to write uh, a new communication module for every type of thing that we're going to communicate, okay? Communicate to. And similarly, if we come up with a new uh, way to communicate, like a packet radio or something, we don't want to have to do an N squared uh, communication between every application and every new communication media. You know, this this looks silly when you think about it, but clearly there's a level of abstraction, kind of like our device drivers uh, that needs to be employed here. And if you've taken, uh, you know, if you've taken networking, you certainly know what that's about, right? So how does the internet avoid this? Well, we put a layering in here. Okay, we put intermediate layering and um, a set of abstractions provi providing network functionality and technologies. And so as a result, a new application uh, that we add on here like HTTP really has to figure out how to communicate with this intermediate layer, which is often called the narrow waste of the internet protocol. Um, looks kind of like an hourglass. Um, and you know, if I put it some new communication technology um, I ba basically have to figure out how to match the intermediate layers to communication technology. And I've just made my problem much simpler because of abstraction, okay? And of course, this is the typical hourglass that everybody sees when they take an, uh, an IP class, a networking class, um, where IP is the protocol of choice at the narrow layers. It wasn't always that way, but it's became, become that way. And now all of the layers above have to just send IP packets and all the layers below have to uh, communicate IP between different sites. And if we do that, then we basically have the internet, okay? And um, it's astonishing how well this has worked uh, to, to basically connect a whole bunch of devices and computers and storage and everything simply by standardizing uh, IP in the middle here. Um, so what are the implications of this hourglass? So there's a single internet layer module, that's the IP protocol, allows arbitrary networks to operate. Uh, any technology that supports IP can exchange packets. It allows applications to function on all networks. So applications that can run on IP can use any network. Um, it supports simultaneous innovations above and below. So um, you, know, you can do all sorts of stuff to the above the application layer, uh, you can do all sorts of stuff but the, below the, the physical layers. You can have many different physical layers, but changing IP itself has turned out to be very challenging. So um, there's a funny story about IPv6, which has been the, you know, the next IP protocol for the last 20 years. Um, only in the last, I would say, five years has it really taken a hold and started to become a reasonable uh, protocol. Um, it's been very hard to swap out IPv4, which is a traditional one with IPv6, because it had been so... Uh, embedded in the world. Um, so some drawbacks, however, of layering are the kind, uh, all of the drawbacks that you could imagine, especially now that you've been through 162. So, you know, layer N may end up duplicating stuff that layer N minus one is doing, or layers need a bunch of the same information. So you end up communicating a bunch of information up and down the layers, and you got a bunch of memory copies and it's expensive. Um, layering may hurt performance. Well, that you know, the, any API could potentially be made faster by flattening the API out. Uh, but then again, you know, if you do this the wrong way, you end up with this n squared communicate or n squared pattern again, and that's not a good idea, right? So there's this trade-off between performance and uh, and APIs and uh, and layering, and it turns out that with IP, that's been an extremely powerful trade-off. Okay, now. Um, but what I'd like to talk about is uh, the end-to-end -end argument. Um, there was a hugely influential paper, which again is on the resources page, um, by Seltzer, Reed, and Clark from 1984. Um, so I realize that's ancient history now, but it's one of these papers that still has uh, some very important philosophy uh, in it that I think I want to make sure everybody gets here. So it's the, some would call it the sacred text of the internet. Um, there's been endless deb uh, debate, uh, sorry, talking too long, endless disputes about what it actually means. Um, everybody cites it 
as supporting their position. Um, you know, uh, you could imagine that that's true of pretty much any good document uh, that lots of people read. Um, they'll get into philosophical arguments about it. Um, the message, however, is pretty simple, which is that some types of network functionality can only be cor correctly implemented from end to end. Uh, and things like reliability, security, et cetera, are examples of such, okay? And because of this, the end hosts can basically satisfy the requirements without the network help, and therefore, um, and they must do it anyway, and therefore you could imagine that the network didn't have to do that. Okay, so the, the way that this paper ends, if you go to read this, is basically that you don't have to go out of your way to implement stuff in the network because you gotta do it at the endpoints anyway. All right, and the simplest example here um, that they give, which I think is very uh, telling, is the idea of you got two hosts and uh, host A has a file they want to send to host B. And of course, you've got uh, applications for the file transfer, you've got the operating system, you've got networks, et cetera. All of these are parts of that. And you might ask yourself, well, how do I transmit? Well, um, you know, the application reads it off the disk. Uh, it sends it to the operating system, which then, you know, sends it out of a socket, um, which then comes up the operating system the other side, um, goes into the application, which then writes it to the disk. And the question is, how do you make that reliable? Well, one option is you make everything reliable, okay? So you make it 100% reliable that you load the file off the disk and then 100% reliable that uh, things get transferred from the application to the OS. So that transfer might not be so bad, but then you got to somehow uh, make sure that when it goes across the network, um, every link that's in the middle. So if we're transmitting from Berkeley to Beijing, uh, there's a whole bunch of other things. There's transatlantic cables, you know, there's a, a bunch of hops at different levels, and there's a lot of uh, detail in this link that we're not talking about right now. And we'd have to make sure that every link was 100% reliable. Okay, and that way we concatenate everything together and we get 100% transfer, okay? Except it never works that way, right? It's very hard to make something 100% reliable. And furthermore, it's still possible that um, you missed something. And uh, one of the things that is, uh, is interesting about that paper is they relate a story from uh, 1984 in which, uh, they were transmitting um, copies of the kernel source code from one host to another. And it was only going across a few buildings or whatever, but there were a lot of hops in between. And they were carefully checksumming and catching every hop along the way to try to make sure that this was never screwed up. Except what they didn't realize what the, was that in some of the routers along the way, um, even though each of the links were carefully checksummed and made to be reliable, the routers actually had a bug in them that would, uh, I think it would transpose bits every million bytes that it transmitted in memory because there was a bug in the source code of the router. And as a result, even though they checksummed everything along the way, the data got slowly corrupted and the, uh, the kernel had been transferred back and forth across these links a couple of times, many times. And as a result, the data was slowly getting corrupted. Okay, we used to call that bit rot. All right, and it was totally unexpected, and it, it uh, things got so corrupted they had to pull things back off of tape in order to fix it. Okay, so this idea of making things uh, reliable by fixing everything in the middle is uh, not only very hard, it might not be the right thing. So what's the other option is you take it from uh, point A and you transmit it as well as you can to point B, and then you check at the end, you say, well, did I... Uh, did I get the file that it was expected? And so I compute a, a hash or a checksum at one end, I send it to the other, I check it out, and either I've got the file or I don't. And if I don't, then I can retransmit, okay? And so what's good about this end-to-end -end approach is it actually makes up for all sorts of problems in the middle by catching uh, bad transmission, okay? Now, of course, what's pointed out in the paper is uh, if you've got a, a one kilobyte file versus a versus a you know gigabyte file, the problem is the more data you're transmitting, so the gigabyte file is more likely to fail in the middle than the one kilobyte file. And so if you have a really large file and you wait until the very end before you check sum it, 
you're going to have a lot of failures before you succeed. And in fact, it may take a very long time. And so that's why you want to break things into chunks and uh, sort of individually check end to end. But the point of this uh, example is that if things have to be done at the endpoints, then maybe you don't need to do them as carefully in the middle as you might otherwise, OK? And, and then, as a result, any reliability you might do in the middle is really for perf improving performance, OK? Now, um, so the second option is basically uh, saying, well, here's the checksum of what I got. It goes back. And as a result, um, you pull the file off the disk. And this application, the original one, checks it and sees whether uh, you're good to go, OK? Now, um, Solution one, as I said, was incomplete because if the memory is corrupted, the receiver has to do the check anyway. Solution two is complete because you, you had to do it anyway. And so um, is there any need to implement reliability at all at the lower layers? OK, and the end-to-end -end argument, by the way, if you know anything about the history of the internet, is kind of what was used to justify the, um, the structure of the basic internet as it is right now, which is a datagram service, we'll talk more about that um, in a lecture or two, where packets of, of small size are sent across, and they either make it or they don't. But um, uh, we don't worry about that because we're checking everything at the end to end. Okay, And so this paper and the end to end uh, philosophy in general was kind of the reason the internet's the way it is. Now, um, it could be more efficient, though, to do something. OK, so as I mentioned, yes, we could just send the, the, uh, the data to the other side and hope it gets there and retransmit it if it doesn't. But at some point, that might be too expensive to keep retransmitting if I had a really bad link in the middle. And so there's a performance reason for improving things in the middle, but there isn't a functionality need to improve things in the middle. And so this discussion leads to a trade-off about how much work do you want to do in the middle. OK? So implementing complex functionality in the network doesn't reduce the host implementation complexity, because you still got to do it. And it does increase the network complexity. Probably gives you delay and overhead in every application, even if they don't need it. So this is kind of arguing that maybe you don't need to do something in the middle if you have to do it at the ends. OK? But implementing things in the network can enhance performance in some cases, like very lossy links. Now, uh, what's interesting is a conservative interpretation of the end-to-end -end argument, just like there's always conservative and liberal interpretations of pretty much anything, could say, well, don't bother implementing it at all at the lower level unless it can be completely implemented at that level and doesn't need to be in the endpoints. Um, or unless you re actually relieve burden from the host, don't bother. A modern interpretation, or a moderate, I like to think of modern as well, is basically think twice before implementing something in the network. If the host can do it correctly, then um, implement it in the lower layers only if it's going to be a performance enhancement uh, or has a good justification. And only do it if it doesn't impose burden that uh, on apps that don't need it. OK, and this is the interpretation that I always use and that I, I suggest in this class. And you might ask, well, is this still valid? Uh, and there are some instances where this particular modern interpretation is, in fact, uh, not even quite enough, OK? Which is, what about denial of service? So if somebody is going to attack a communication stream from outside, there might actually be a pretty good argument for um, putting firewalls and checksums and everything on intermediate links to basically prevent the denial of service. So in that instance, uh, even though the end-to-end -end communication still has to happen, you're enhancing the overall path in the middle by putting functionality in there. Or privacy, right? If I want to prevent privacy, putting firewalls in the middle makes sense, OK? Um, or maybe there's things that have to be done in the network. So certain routing protocols, which pick paths from point A to point B, have to be done in the network. They can't really be done too well end-to-end. -to -end. All right. So how do you actually program a distributed application? So this is going to be our topic for next time. You need to synchronize multiple threads running on different machines. Uh, there's no shared memory. There's no test and set. So all of the stuff that we talked about earlier in the term really isn't quite available to you in this simple view of the world, which is a bunch of messages. I send from one thing, and I receive on the other. 
So there's one abstraction over the network. Um, it's already atomic, so no receiver gets a portion of the message because typically we check some things. And so if a bad message goes through, we stop, uh, we throw it out and retransmit. So the interface is sort of like a mailbox where the sender directs a message at a receiver's mailbox as a temporary holding area at the destination. Um, and we have the idea of a send of a message to the mailbox and a receive, which is blocking often to wait for a message to show up. Now, what we're going to do next lecture is we're going to say, can we take this basic idea and can we build something interesting on top of it that will allow us to build these distributed applications, will allow us to do um, to synchronize state machines amongst uh, multiple machines, and ultimately lets us do pretty interesting uh, distributed peer-to-peer -peer style applications. So that'll be for next time. So in conclusion, um, I brought back this idea of the illities. OK, availability is how often is the resource available. Durability, how often is it preserved against faults? Reliability, how often is the resource performing correctly? We talked about preserving the bits. So I like to think of erasure codes or RAID as preserving the bits. Copy on write is about preserving the integrity, not the bits. So with by copy on write, I make a bunch of changes that are new by not overwriting anything, but rather sort of using pointers to the old data. That's copy on write. And that allows us to uh, basically preserve the integrity of the old data, even while I'm changing it. Uh, we talked about how logs can improve reliability. Um, we talked about journal file systems such as ext3 and NTFS is similar. And in general, we talked about transactions over a log as a general solution. Um, and hopefully, uh, the examples that I gave there worked out well. We talked, started talking about protocols between parties uh, that will help us build distributed applications. We spent some time with the end-to-end -end argument, which will hopefully uh, inform us as we go forward. And next time, we'll start talking about distributed decision-making, such as two-phase commit. Um, didn't quite get there this time, but we'll definitely do that next time. So I'm going to say goodbye to everybody. I'm sorry for going over. I guess I've been doing that a lot this term. My apologies. But uh, I hope you have a good evening, and we will see you on Wednesday.